Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, we do appreciate you making time to be here today, and we're very excited about the program. Um, and we'll be introducing the former part of the program in a moment, but just to get you thinking about it right now, this program is about you. We really want to provide information that helps you personally, um, because often the questions you have about your job search or career management are questions other people will have. So um, please think about what your challenge might be or what your question might be, and um, we'd love to hear from you, uh, and Morris will talk about that in a moment. And today, um, I'm going to actually now turn it over to um, Morris. And Morris, if you want to make the intros and you want me to continue to control the, um, I think this is our last slide anyway. Uh, sure. Thank you, Ken. Great job. Um, if I were not a member, I would be calling you up to find out more about membership. You did a really good sell job there in, in 30 seconds. Me, that was great. Call me anytime, Morris. It's fine. Excellent. Thank you. So we do have um, a real cool panel today three great career coaches. Uh, they approach it from different areas. Um, and we're going to hear uh, a little bit about their background and kind of how, how did you get to where you are today? Um, and what do you do for a living? So if we start with Charlie Timmons, human archaeologist, love that title, strategic advisor and motivational speaker. Charlie, can you tell us a little bit about your background and you know how you got to where you are today? Very happy to, Marsh. Glad to be here. And uh, for all the people in the audience, you're going to get a treat. You're going to hear some good feedback on your questions. Hopefully, it'll give you an idea or two that you could put into motion that can make some difference in the months and weeks ahead for you. Listen, I deal in one of life's little mysteries. That is helping professionals like us successfully navigate our career transitions. There are 56 different kinds of transitions in the world. And within the world of career transitions, there's seven or eight. I've been through most of them personally. Transitioning to better opportunities is always challenging. I think everybody on this call will agree with that. But most people fall short of their dreams, of their aspirations during a transition. What I do is I fix that. See, it's a marketing challenge. I believe that facts sell, but stories sell. It's our stories that reveal our value. I partner with senior level folks like you to uncover their authentic story, the story that will really sell. Leverage it to differentiate them and get people of influence to open doors to referrals and decision makers. It's their well-crafted stories that can turn their challenges into successes. So uh, the human archaeologist tagline there really has its focus on me uncovering what the hidden potential is with the people that they have on the inside. It's an inside out process so that they can serve their target audience better, build a game plan to land the ideal position and guide them through every step of the way until they land. Glad to be here today. Turn it back to you, Morris. Awesome, really cool. I was hoping that that meant human archeologists that you dig into people. I don't know, there's a joke there somewhere. Ford <laughs> Myers, uh, please, career coach, author and speaker. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, sure. Thank you, Morris. So um, I had a previous career in the marketing communications field, and uh, I was an entrepreneur and pretty successful. But at midstream, I decided I wanted something else. And I made a major career change, like many of you have, I'm sure. Um, I went back to graduate school, got whole, all new training, completely uh, reoriented my professional life. I went to work then for the large outplacement firms. These are the big uh, global career services firms. And I learned the business inside and out. And then I eventually was able to go back out on my own, start my own business again, which is Career Potential LLC. And what I do is I help clients take charge of their careers, create the work they love and earn what they deserve. Fantastic. Excellent, Ken. Um, Ken Scher, career coach, executive coach, and keynote speaker, please. Yeah, I don't know who took off Man About Town on that, yeah. but I, I used to be there. And um, Bon Vivant. That's right. Well, I'm very excited to be part of this panel because as a kid, I always looked up to Charlie and Ford, so I'm <laughs> really happy to be on the panel with them today. Um, but seriously, it really is an honor. Those, those two are really two of the best coaches in the area for sure. 
Um, I'm Ken Scherer. I, my company is called Scherer Coaching. I spent almost 25 years at Johnson & Johnson in different sales, marketing, and leadership, uh, leadership roles. And I led um, the sales recruiting department for the U.S., as well as three different sales training and leadership development teams. And for all that great stuff, after 25 years, I got laid off at 52 years old with two kids in college and one in high school. So I know the feeling of being let go. I know the feeling of being out of work and that pressure, uh, especially if you're mid to late career, of finding your next opportunity. And um, it took me a while personally to overcome that. But once I did, I did find three new jobs in my while I was still in my 50s, but I realized that corporate America was not for me anymore. So I started my own practice about eight years ago. And now I feel like uh, I've refound my passion in helping people get through what I had to get through and helping them advance their career in whatever way they need to. So I'm very excited about today. And uh, Morris, I'll turn it back to you. Fantastic. Excellent. So I'll start it off uh, with a question that we had um, uh, from, from some folks at Beacon. And that is, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing job seekers today? You want to start with Charlie? What do you want me to go first? I'd love to. Okay, great. I think the biggest challenge that I've seen now, remember, I've been doing this for over 25 years. So I've been through um, the financial crisis, the dot com bubble, all kinds of ups and downs. And the thing that I see today is people's total lack of self awareness. Who really are they? They're out there, they're talking to people, they're trying to get people to refer them to people, but they don't know themselves. That lack of self-awareness affects their authentic voice. They come across with uncertainty about themselves. They've made it, it that lack of self-awareness can contribute to some bad career decision-making. And they're gonna end up settling for less. 80% of the time they settle for less and then it's rinse and repeat. They go back and they try it again. We have to know ourselves better before we can go out to the marketplace and tell them who we are, what we are, and how we can add value. That's what I've noticed, Morris. That's really interesting. Once again, the archeologist turns it internal. I think that's really cool. Um, you know, Ken or Ford, you have a thought here on the biggest challenge? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to Ford. add something. I'd like to add something. <clears throat> I believe that the greatest challenge right now is more uh, emotional, personal, um, and sort of philosophical. Uh, what I mean by that is that we're living in a time of great uncertainty, incredible disorientation, uh, great confusion about the future. Uh, the world of work itself has been completely upended and turned on its, on its head. Um, you know, we're facing enormous challenges in the world with uh, coronavirus, with war in Europe, with the unprecedented political and cultural turmoil in the United States. And I think a lot of people are kind of walking around in a state of uh, PTSD. They're sort of um, in a daze and they don't know really what the future holds or how to behave or what to do. Um, now, you know, some of this may just be in internal, mental, but there really is a lot of uncertainty and disorientation as I see it. So I think people have become a bit unmoored. They've become uh, sort of confused and uh, turned around in circles. And I think it's a real challenge. I, I think it's a real, real challenge that I see in many of my clients. So that's not to sound totally negative because I think that with some help, people can get reoriented and they can find their anchor again. But that's what I see right now as the greatest underlying challenge. Yeah, and I, I think related to that, Ford, is um, I think that although there are a lot of very uh, basic things in a job search that have remained the same, the importance of networking, the importance of having a good resume and LinkedIn profile, I think people need to recognize that um, there are different skills and competencies that um, may have taken on greater importance today. Uh, for example, in a hybrid work world or even a remote work world, um, being able to demonstrate that you've taken initiative in the past, that you're a self-starter, that you uh, have good time management skills, good commute, computer skills. Um, those are the skills that maybe in the past weren't as important as they are today, as well as soft skills to Ford's point of um, being able to show empathy, being able to show good leadership ability in these really uh, very uh, times filled with lots of turmoil. 
So I do think uh, recognizing and understanding what's most important today in terms of how you market yourself as a potential employee. That's really cool. I think so taking that confusion and taking that the, the work that needs to happen in order to kind of focus your own vision, I'm going to just to juxtapose, juxtapose that. I'm going to compare that to the fact that it looks like and what we hear is that there's millions of jobs out there. This great resignation and people are flipping jobs like pancakes. Well, why am I having trouble finding my next gig? Why am I having trouble finding my next job? Ford, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, look, you know, there's the information that we get from the media, from the news, things like, oh, there's a million jobs out there and, you know, companies can't find enough good people. So all you have to do is stand out on the corner and you'll get 20 job offers. Well, I've heard that and I've read that, but I don't believe that because I still think that employers are careful about hiring decisions because they're under other kinds of financial pressures. And I also think that, as Ken indicated, the rules still apply. You still have to be really good at marketing yourself. You have to be really good at articulating your value. You have to be really good at knowing exactly what you want and how to get it. You have to have outstanding credentials and documents. Your interviewing and networking skills have to be top notch. So none of that has changed, even though some people feel like it has changed. Also, like I said, uh, it, you know, it's still not so easy to navigate through the career world and get the best job or the best fit for your next role. Um, regardless of what the media is saying, uh, don't buy into it. The, the, the basic uh, structure still applies. The basic requirements still apply. And so I see this as a great time to improve and enhance your career management skills and your job searching skills rather than just uh, getting lazy because, oh, I'll get a job in 10 minutes, no problem. I, I don't buy into that at all. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Ford, on that too. Um, I think too, often I think sometimes they're talking about maybe hourly workers or um, right. people that are non-salaried people are, are more difficult to find. But even that being the case, are there jobs uh, um, in the director level and above? There certainly are. But there's also a lot of competition still, and maybe even more than ever, because people are quitting their jobs to find new ones. So to Ford's point, really honing your career management skills, honing your message, um, really knowing what you want to accomplish in an interview, building your network, all those things where you have support of other people, where you have the message that you need to in a very consistent way being delivered over LinkedIn, your resume, networking conversation and interviews. I think it's more important than ever to really um, hone in on your messaging to have more impact. Communication is king. I mean, I think that sounds or queen either way, but communication is important. Uh, there are two questions that are so um, kind of similar here that and I'm thinking maybe there are folks because this is a beacon crowd. We do get uh, this sort of thought process. So um, a couple of the folks have asked, uh, they are a unique individual. They are uh, chasing unicorns. I love it. And they've done some really different things in their careers. Maybe they have been in a position of authority, but in a smaller organization, or they wore multiple hats in, in a certain organization. Well, now they're ready to move on to something else, and they're kind of having trouble. How do I apply that kind of broad-based or unique experience? How do I uh, apply that to a role that, number one, maybe is not generally advertised, um, or that somebody sort of has to meet me and find out about me in order to say, hmm, there's a spot. Let's bring Morris into that uh, spot. And I think I'm going to ask this of Charlie um, because Charlie is generally the uh, mayor of networking town. So um, that uh, I think maybe you've got some insight into that, Charlie. Thank you, Morris. Um, earlier, I said, know thyself. What do I mean by that? I mean, you have to understand your passions. You have to understand your vision, your purpose. You have to understand what separates you from other people. When you know your product, because this is a marketing game, when you know your product, now you look to the marketplace and said, who needs that? That's what all product managers have to do in business. 
They have to figure out what does the customer want? What does the customer need? How does my product fit? And we have to niche it down to figure out who in that marketplace is a buyer for what it is that you're offering them. And finding a way of bringing those two together. That's where your networking is so important. You have a message, you refine that particular message. You have to reveal that message to people that are relevant to the niche that you're going after. Because when they hear what you have to say, it'll resonate. And they're gonna be more likely to introduce you to people of influence that need that product or service that you're offering to get that conversation going. Because without that conversation, you're not gonna under, under, uh, under, uncover the uh, opportunities that may exist in that organization. They're not gonna see the relevance of what you can do to help their bottom line. They're interested in three things. Can you make the money, save the money, or can you save them time? And that's gonna come through once you know who you are, what you can do, what value you can add, to the kinds of issues or challenges a niche market has for you. Hopefully that added some light to the picture there. Thank you, Charlie. May I add something, Morris? Absolutely. Okay, so I have three answers to this question and they are networking, networking, and networking. So here's my point. My point is that you have had a unique role. You've been able to pursue what you call these unicorn opportunities, which are very different. They're non-traditional. Um, you've worn multiple hats, done many things. You haven't come up through the standard corporate ladder, let's say. So what this says to me is that going after corporate jobs or large company where it's hot, highly uh, hierarchical and very uh, structured, I don't think that's the right path if I'm understanding the question correctly. I would instead go toward companies that are more entrepreneurial, startups, small companies, where you are expected to wear many hats and where the principals or owners there will appreciate the fact that you can do many things in many ways and large corporate uh, environments just simply generally do not appreciate that or respect that or desire that. So my advice in short is to go through relationships, networking, because you have to uncover those unique special situations, go after the small companies, entrepreneurial companies, the startup companies, and do that specifically through extensive networking. Yeah, and I'm, I think both those answers are great. Charlie's to have, have your message, know what it is and what you have to offer, and Ford, um, make sure you're looking in the right place, looking for love in all the right places. Um, and I do want to add about networking. You know, networking, it's not about asking for a job. If you go in and consider that you're going on a networking conversation and that's what you're going to, that's your goal to ask for a job, you're not going to have too many more networking conversations because people aren't going to refer you to other people. Networking is about learning about the other person you're talking to, learn about their career, their business, how they got to where they got to. Then letting them know a little bit about yourself and asking for advice and guidance. How can I break into an organization like this? How can I use my skills? You know, where do you think my skills might be best used? Um, are there other people you can introduce me to? Um, you know, can I help you in any way? That's what networking is about. It should be a give and take conversation. And through those conversations, you'll get more clarity on what direction you want to go. You might learn of a direction you never thought of beforehand. It might clarify things for you, or it might give you a couple of options coming out of it. So networking is more, networking conversations to me are more exploratory than anything else. And I think that kind of may be a similar answer um, to the question of how do you do a career change? How do you make a career change? Um, that's a question that folks have kind of asked a few times. But by exploring your environment, by meeting additional folks and asking their advice, the sad truth, I think, of human nature is that people like to talk about themselves. So if you ask questions of someone and ask for their advice, there's potentially a better chance there to establish a relationship and, you know, to find opportunity. I think it's a great point. Um, there is a question about a couple of kind of the old school questions that people ask. Uh, and it seems as if maybe they're outdated, but we know that they still get asked. How do you suggest answering things like what is your greatest strength or weakness? What is your greatest accomplishment? And then why are you seeking to leave or why are you seeking a new position? 
couple of normal um, interview questions, but how do you suggest answering those? Um, if you don't mind, maybe I'll just take sure. a quick, uh, I'll start us out. Um, I really do believe in the importance, in the value of having a process to answer your interview questions. The reason why I love a process, is, there are actually a couple reasons. One, it allows you to tell a story. And stories are very compelling and they're very memorable as opposed to just some blah, blah, blah answer. The second thing is there's a beginning, middle, and an end to the story. Uh, interviewing can be stressful. And a lot of times when people get stressed, they can ramble and go off, off uh, script, so to speak. Um, you don't want to be in an interview and ask the interviewer, what was the question again? That's not a good place to be. So by having a process, you know what your beginning, middle, and end is. One last point is that I believe in what I call what's called the STARS method. And I know you've heard of STAR probably, but I add an S. Uh, it's situation, task, action, result. And the S is, so why am I telling you this? And I think whatever answer you give, however, whatever process you use or whatever answer you give, you always want to try to connect your answer to the job at hand so that the interviewer knows, oh, that's why they're telling me. I could see how that will benefit me if I put them into this position. You're painting the picture of you in that role and make it easy for your interviewer to see that. Mm -hmm. And um, Charlie, you want to add to that? Yeah, with regards to what is your greatest strength or weakness point, uh, I agree with Ken. I believe that when you tell a story, you're humanizing the facts about what you, who you are and what you're about. So it's that human factor that comes into it. But listen, if, if anybody in the audience here has not taken the, the Clifton Strength Finders 34 to figure out what are their five to 10 top strengths, these are validated strengths. A client of mine the other day was asked in an interview, a panel interview about strengths. And she went through and explained each of the five strengths that strength finders helped her discover and related those back to what the job description was. And they were taking notes when she gave that answer. So if you haven't taken strength finders, take it because it explains a lot about how good you really, really are in the marketplace. And when it comes to weaknesses, you have to admit that you have them. The important thing is what were they? What did you learn about those weaknesses? What are you doing to work on it day in and day out? Because they want to understand that you can recognize when you're coming up short and that you can put a game plan in place to reverse it. So they are not going to be impacted by the weakness that you had in a previous role. Hopefully that was helpful. And thank you, Charlie. Let me add this. The word here in my mind is practice, 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 practice. Look, you're going to be asked these questions. You can't control that. And it's very important that you that you uh, anticipate this, that you- What you got? Come here and show me. Give me your toy. Uh, that you practice these questions. I work with my clients extensively to go over these questions. We do role play. I give them feedback. We improve and refine their performance and we practice again. So you don't want to be you know, caught uh, by surprise, you don't want to wing it or improvise. You have to be completely polished and ready, sort of like an actor who goes out on stage. They have to know their lines. So that's what I would add to that. Excellent. Let's talk, um, you know, a little bit brass tacks here. Uh, do people ever still provide and do recruiters ever look at a cover letter? Ford, how about you? Okay. Uh, I believe in cover letters. I believe they're very important to customize or refine your application, your interest in a position. Um, so we practice a lot on those and uh, we make sure that people are really good at producing excellent cover letters. Now, sometimes, you know, like for example, if you're applying for a job online, God forbid, uh, they may not allow any space to put in a cover letter. I understand that. Um, but wherever you can submit a cover letter, you should. And if we can assume that you're going to be spending most of your time, your job search time on networking, then obviously a cover letter can be, uh, can be offered. So do people read them? Here's what I have learned by talking to many hiring managers and many recruiters. If 
you look like you're pretty qualified, if you look like you're a fairly good fit, then the company will spend some time looking at all your materials, including the cover letters. If they think your initial materials look terrible or they're not appropriate, then they'll reject the whole package. But when, when, when companies get serious and when they seem to have an initial interest in you, yes, they will read the cover letter. And then when they narrow down the field of only a few remaining candidates, then they'll even pay more attention to things like a cover letter. So we cannot control other people's behavior. We, we don't know if they're going to read it, but we can hope. And our job is to put our best face forward, our best foot forward, and try to introduce a really great, concise, very much to the point cover letter. That's great advice. Just to throw out there, I know my background is human resources technology. So you're putting in uh, information into it, an applicant tracking system. Usually, for most of these systems, every document that you put in is scanned. And if they're utilizing the system the way they should, every word that is in there can be parsed and can be added to a score for that candidate to get you potentially higher up in the list. So if they're using the ATS the way they are, uh, then you will be a more interesting candidate by having that cover letter. I agree. And I love it for once they start to look at you and bring you in for a few interviews. Now they're hungry for information. That's a great point. That's where the cover letter would be, uh, could be a really good idea. Morris, There's another, go ahead, Charlie, go ahead. If I could add, both you and Ford made great points. Listen, we're, this is a game of competitive edge. How do you have a competitive edge over the other candidates? Now, you don't know who they are. You don't know what they can do differently than you can. You know yourself. Picture yourself as a hiring manager. The individual that you're hiring is there to support you and help you with your mission within that organization. So you want somebody that can express themselves well, can persuade people to their particular point of view. How are they going to know that with just a resume? A cover letter lets them understand how you think, how you organize your thoughts, how you express yourself in the language of their organization. It gives you that edge so it can visualize you in that job, communicating in a manner that's consistent with what they need in order to get things done. So cover letters, in my opinion, are absolutely necessary. And the other thing is, it's a great exercise for you. You have all this knowledge about yourself. The cover letter forces you to bring it together into a succinct document that not only captures their imagination, but can also succinctly say, here's the value that I bring to the table. You know, Morris, if I could jump in, too, because, um, again, I think each point that Ford made and um, Charlie made, they're building on each other. Um, I, I'm actually surprised that there's even a debate about it, because my feeling is this. If um, a recruiter or hiring manager is looking for a cover letter and you don't send one, that could knock you out of the running right there. But if they're not looking for one and you send one, it doesn't matter. So why not send one, right? Because it could only help you. It's not going to hurt you. And then the other point I want to make quickly is, um, you know, to Charlie's point, the content of that letter is important. But I also believe that the opening is really important. If you're writing a cover letter, dear sir, madam, I'm writing to you about the project manager role I saw posted, rec number, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing to that. So make that opening line something compelling, something interesting. Uh, just as an example, I saw one person who wrote, ever since I uh, visited my first Marriott on a family vacation when I was 12 years old, I've always marveled at the customer service that your staff provides. That's why I'm excited to write to you and to apply for the customer service role, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something that really grabs their attention can really make for a great cover letter. I'm going to switch slightly to um, if I'm in a toxic situation in my current role? Should I just get out at all costs or should I try and hang and wait for that right next role? What do you advise as a career coach? Oh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, it depends. The answer is it depends. Um, if it's really toxic, you know, really disrespectful, really punishing, uh, then there's absolutely no reason to stay and you should leave immediately. Now, you could try first to fix it. You know, you can talk to the boss and you can uh, try to raise the issue and try to pursue a positive change. 
But if they're not receptive and if no change occurs, which it probably won't, then you've got to move on whether you have another job waiting for you or not. There's no reason and no excuse for being mistreated and abused at work when it's a serious situation. Now, on the other hand, if it's just mildly uncomfortable or you know, uh, just slightly disrespectful or whatever, then I would say, um, you know, see the writing on the wall, start looking for something else, and then leave as soon as you can, as soon as you find a better opportunity. Uh, but I've seen too many people stay in horrible, abusive, toxic situations. There's no excuse for it. You're too old, you're too, you're too experienced, you're too educated and too smart to put up with that. Great advice. How about uh, if I'm looking for, is there a difference between looking for an employee role or going to consult either out on my own or consult you know, in a, in a consulting organization? Is there a difference between taking an in-house role versus a consulting role? Do you mean and is there a better way to prepare? Do you mean with regard to toxicity? What? Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm flipping all over the place here, Ford. No, I loved your answer on toxicity, but okay. just in general. Consulting role versus an employee role. How, how would I adjust my message? Are there things I should say differently? You guys play go? I'm going to suggest Charlie, if you don't mind, Charlie, because I think this is kind of Charlie's wheelhouse, helping people make those kind of decisions. Do you mind? Um, so we don't know, we ourselves don't know whether we're capable of doing consulting or not until we've done it. A lot of clients have said to me, Charlie, my whole life has been nothing but a bunch of projects. Companies give me projects. I get my team together and we attack the problem and we solve them but why can't i just go out and do that for corporations rather than work for them work in the corporation i can work as an outside consultant that to me makes a lot of sense and here's another reason why one should consider the consulting most of the people on this call are not spring chickens most of the people on this have lots of experience they got a lot of mileage on the odometer we're getting in the latter parts of our career do we really want to be on the hamster wheel or do we want to begin transitioning away from that? And one of the ways to do that is to enter into doing some consulting work that may set you up for life after that hamster wheel. So I recommend that people look at themselves as consultants and they interview as consultants. Why? Because companies may not be looking for a long-term fix. Companies may only have a short-term problem. And if you position yourself as a employee that you only want full-time work, that part-time work, that interim work that you could get to build your resume, to get into a new industry, you're not gonna have that particular opportunity. So and it's up to each individual, because each individual has to be comfortable with that decision because it affects how they interview, how they network, how they share their stories with other folks. And more importantly, what do they put on their LinkedIn profile? All of this is impacted by that decision. If I could add, please, th thank you, Charlie. If I could add something, um, so you've, as Charlie indicated, you've got to be very clear about what you're doing and what you're pursuing. You cannot be both. You can't ride two horses at the same time. Are you going after consulting, contracting, freelance, whatever you want to call it, or are you going after a full-time corporate role? I've had people I know who try to do a little bit of both and try to you know, no, you cannot do that. It's too confusing and the employers will not understand that and your, and your prospective clients won't get it either. It also leaves you personally very confused. You cannot do both. Now, let me say something else, which is a lot more specific and tangible. If you're going to be a consultant, that means you're in business for yourself, right? When you're in business for yourself, you have to be very, very committed to sales and marketing. The business doesn't just show up on your doorstep. You have to go out and get it. And so if you're not willing and able, if you don't want to spend 50% or more of your time selling and marketing, then you've got no business going into business for yourself, which means you have no business trying to be a consultant. So that's my opinion. Having been a consultant many times, having helped many, many clients transition from corporate into consulting and from consulting back into corporate. 
they seem to, to miss this very important point that it's all about sales and marketing if you're going to be in business for yourself. We assume you're good at what you do. We assume you have excellent technical and trade skills. That's a given. What separates success from failure is sales. So I want you to please think about that when you're considering going into a full-time consulting position. Yeah, you know, related to that too, Ford, and, and this is um, coming from my experience when I was um, laid off. You know, initially you think, okay, well, I'll just call on those people, all my great friends who are there. I'll call on them, and I'll I'll have more business than I'll know what to do. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> One of the sad truths about losing your job is that some people who you thought were your good friends don't show up for you, and that was actually that was a, a bit of a blow for me. I was really surprised by that, but I was also encouraged by the fact that there were people I didn't know I that I had a good relationship with who would call me and check in with me, who would offer me support and help. And so, you know, if you're going into consulting because you think you've got this great network that's going to just line up to do business with you, you might want to check on that before you make that decision. Great point. And the second Very thing is, to, I agree with Ford, you can't ride two horses at the same time. But again, going back to my situation, the one thing I wish I would have done um, in anticipation, I, I, I kind of knew that my time was running out of J&J, was maybe to start get some training, some certifications while I was still employed to prepare for life after my corporate role. So you can't do two things at once, but you can do your job and prepare for your next opportunity, I think. The same yes, way. good point. The interesting point that you guys are making too with the two horses, um, the one place where you might be able to ride two horses, I can't think of a metaphor, but the one place would be in a networking situation. So you're working the room and you're having conversations with people and listening and, you know, asking questions. If you hear of someone who is looking for a consultant, who does something that's in your toolbox, then maybe you don the hat of, you know, or ride the horse of I'm going to look for this consulting thing. It, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. And I think if you have a clear and concise way to state your case and make your case for why you have certain skills, that it, it could come up. So I think that's pretty interesting. There's a really good question that came in that I, I think is uh, many of us um, ask, how do you possibly stay motivated as you're trying to get a new role? Um, it's a, a lot of rejection. And what are ways that people can either invigorate or reinvigorate their efforts and to stay positively motivated? You know, one of the things that I advise my clients, um, I mentioned to you having a process for in answering interview questions, and again, in my case, I use STARS, is I have my clients literally write or type out their STARS answers. And there are a number of benefits you get from that. Um, one of them is obviously you're preparing for interviews. Another one is it helps you with your resume and LinkedIn profile. But a, a third one is that it reminds you of the great things you've done. It reminds you of what you have to offer. It reminds you of better, more positive times. When I was out of work and looking for new um, full-time opportunities, I literally carried those that paper around with me. And when I was feeling down, when I was feeling um, a little bit depressed, I would take it out and remind myself, I do have value to offer. I can deliver for people, for companies. Um, and so it really was very helpful for me that way. And then the other thing too, I'm gonna to go back to networking. You know, there are two types of networks you have. We've been talking about the business network, but you also need to have a personal one, family and friends who are gonna be there to pick you up when you're down. Cause there are a lot of down times as was mentioned. Um, and they're gonna be there to celebrate with you when you do well too. So I, those are two ways that I would approach it. Carly? I would, uh... Listen, when, when we're between positions or we're upset with our job and we're considering changing, we have to research the marketplace we want to go into. So one of the ways to get that optimism up and, and continue to focus at a high level, Morris, is to really become a subject matter expert in the area in which you want to go. Because that to me is something that most people don't do when they have a job. They get so tunnel visioned on doing their job and their quarter to quarter numbers, they forget what's happening out there in the world. And if you can really have a take on what's going on, what's around the corner, what's about to come, 
in networking, you're invaluable to people because you're bringing new information. You're educating everyone you talk to about what's going on in that particular space. You sound like an expert. All you have is a lot of research. What you're trying to do is get somebody to believe in you enough, have confidence in your competence that they're going to refer you. You have to know more than they know. That's why they want to talk to you. You're a subject matter expert. You're in search of a problem that you can solve. Let's not forget that. You're not looking for a job. Who the heck wants to talk to a job seeker? They want to talk to somebody that's got answers to the problems they have. You are focused on solving problems. So what are the problems that you can solve better than anybody else? You've done your research to give people the confidence that you should be listened to get those referrals inside the company. So I really think becoming that subject matter expert is critical. And it really helps your confidence as you're preparing to go out and meet people. Because remember, this is a game of taking strangers and turning them into advocates for your candidacy. And I'd like to add something. Thank you, Charlie. I'd like to add something, which is, it is very, very important to maintain your uh, energy, your motivation, your optimism, because the energy you put out is the energy you're going to get back. So how do you do that? Well, I think that it's important to remain um, uh, energized through education and inspiration. In other words, you have to feed your mind with positive, uplifting material. And that could be self-help stuff. It could be uh, courses, seminars, webinars like this one, uh, inspiring books, lectures, and what have you. In addition, I think that you need to connect with other people, peers, who may be in similar situation. We're talking about support group, support friends, job search buddy, uh, job networking club, clubs and groups. You know, you cannot be in isolation. Isolation is the killer. You've got to guard against isolation. It is the killer. So reach out and connect with people in similar situations who can support you. And also you can support them, which in turn uplifts you. The final thing I'll say is this, and to me, a very important word is balance. You know, when you're out there on your own doing job search, it can be isolating, it can be depressing, it can be frustrating. But one way to maintain healthy balance is to make sure that you're still pursuing your other interests in life that you are sleeping well, you're eating properly, you're maintaining uh, exercise energy, and that you're having a balanced life. I don't believe in putting 100% of all your time and energy into the job search. Sure, you have to work hard at it, but you've got to maintain balance in your life and still pursue the interests and the hobbies and the passions that you ever had. That way you'll keep things in perspective. That's a great perspective. Um, so I'm going to switch gears again. Uh, can you give us some advice? Uh, we, I think maybe two items um, from a LinkedIn perspective that a job seeker needs to make absolutely sure about. I'm going to start with you, Ken. Oh, okay. Um, I think that with LinkedIn, um, just in terms of being very basic about it, the one thing is that you need to have as full a profile as you can. Um, there is a LinkedIn search algorithm that recruiters use, and there are some keys to elevating yourself in that profile, in that search algorithm. Um, having a full profile, having at least 500 connections, um, things like that. But then the next thing I would say is uh, it's really important to be engaged. Um, LinkedIn is not a spectator sport. You need to be in there on a regular basis, commenting, posting, getting your name out there. Um, it's a great marketing tool, and that's how you can market yourself. Excellent. Charlie? I'm happy to, to build on what uh, Ken said. Ken is excellent in how, just go to his, uh, if you're not connected to Ken, get connected. But you'll see how active he is and how he does it. He's a master at it. He's very, very good at that. The people are going to meet you online before they meet you in person today. You know, how many of you have been on these um, uh, weekly networking meetings that are popping up all over the country? And as you're talking, people are look, bringing up your profile, they're looking at your profile, 
they want to get a quick snapshot of who you are, what you are. And if your digital footprint doesn't match what you're saying, that's going to create problems for you. So keep that in mind that the LinkedIn profile, that's your own personal website. That's where you tell the world what your value is, how you can help the world as well as help them. Very, very important. And that's one of the big changes in the last 10 years is the reliance on that platform, LinkedIn, for job seekers and recruiters and internal hiring authorities. And if I may add, sure. um, I think most people are lazy when it comes to their LinkedIn profiles. You know, Ken said, have a complete or comprehensive profile. And yet it's amazing to me how many people just leave whole sections blank. For example, uh, how many LinkedIn recommendations do you have? How many uh, endorsements for your skills do you have? In the little contact button, where, the link where you click contact information, do you have all your contact information in there or did you leave it out? Do you have a photograph? Is it a great photograph? Is it a professional photograph? Do you have the same boring background banner that everybody else has that's provided automatically by LinkedIn? Or have you gotten a uh, customized or at least you know, a more interesting background that is a little bit more unique and distinctive? One more thing I'll say, in the section of where, the, where you list your jobs, your work history, it's amazing to me how many people just have the company name, the title, and maybe like one sentence that says what they did there. Well, you know, what about your achievements? What about your accomplishments? What about your tangible contributions, your measurable um, uh, uh, successes? So flesh it out, spend some time, make it full, make it robust, make it memorable. That's what I'll say. Yeah, and you know, you know I'm sorry, one other thing too, I and afford you jog this in my mind is that a lot of times your profile, it's sending a message that um, it, that you're not even aware you're sending. So to Ford's point, if you don't fill out every section, if you have a, a photograph that's, you know, has somebody's hand on your shoulder because it's at a wedding or some kind of party, um, if, if it's blurry and doesn't look professional, you're sending a message that you don't really care. There's no attention to detail. It's, it's almost disrespectful, to be honest with you. You know, and if your contact information isn't up to date or, um, you know, different things that you are sending messages, it's not the direct message. Often it's the indirect message that can help or hurt you. Absolutely. Should your, should your LinkedIn profile match or mirror or uh, should it be exactly the same as your resume? Or what's the difference between my what I put on the LinkedIn profile and what I put on my resume? I'll let you guys go after that. First of all, in my opinion, they should complement each other. I believe that what you have in your professional experience section on LinkedIn, that should that in many way, ways mirrors what's on your LinkedIn, uh, pardon me, on your resume. So those things need to match up. But so you have an opportunity on LinkedIn to personalize it, to put humanity, personality, if you will, into the message that you're communicating. So they get a feel for the kind of person are, you are, what values you have. Because listen, companies want to hire people like them and people want to work for companies that have their values, their beliefs, their vision. Those things can be communicated on LinkedIn much easier than they can on a resume. So again, they should complement each other. And remember, resumes don't get you hired. LinkedIn profiles don't get you hired. A LinkedIn profile is an invitation to have a conversation with somebody and you treat it that way. What do you want them to know about you that you think is relevant to your future and to their future? If those two things come together, chances are people will want to talk to you more. Very good point. Ken, so, go ahead. Ken did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I um, you know, oftentimes I will just copy and paste the work experience over to the LinkedIn profile, and I think that's perfectly fine. But you also can enhance your LinkedIn profile a little bit more. It doesn't have to be word for word identical, but certainly the messaging and the job titles and you know a lot of that needs to be the same. You might tell it, uh, the story in a little bit of a different way, but um, it should be they should be reflective of each other, as Charlie said. 
One of the other items that I've seen folks do is uh, that once their LinkedIn profile is created, they leave it alone. And, you know, keep in mind that the buzzwords for your industry or for your function have changed over time. So, you know, calling something personnel in, you know, now it's human resources or human capital management or who knows, leadership services, whatever. Uh, keep in mind that those words have changed. And I think that's a place where some folks, it's not lazy necessarily. It's just, oh, my goodness, there are other words I should be using because the buzzwords have changed. So, Point, great point, great point. So you get the conversation because your resume and your LinkedIn stuff is, is spot on. You get that conversation, you have it. How do you follow up? What's the best way to follow up? you like me to do that? I'm throwing it to you just to give it a start. I'm happy to do that. Listen, <laughs> you have to have a program of five to seven distinct messages that you're going to follow up with that you release over time. Sometimes you do it via a phone call and leave a voicemail message, or sometimes it's a email message that you send to somebody, or maybe you drop a note card in the mail thanking them for the meeting. They love that personal stuff. They really, really like it. It really distinguishes you from other people. Nobody gets mail anymore. So when they get something like that, they're going to read it, right? And it has a lot to do with how you express yourself. It's that personal connection. They like it. It helps to distinguish you. But it may take multiple steps in the follow-up process to finally get people to pick up the phone and talk to you. But you have to follow up, follow up, follow up. In the world of sales, as you may know, Morris, you know, they say it takes seven touches or, or interactions between the parties before a deal can happen. Seven. So don't give up. If you really want to be in that organization, if that's the role you really, really want, be persistent. Because if they hire you, they want you to be persistent. That's great. It's characteristic of your work ethic. How about ghosting? Uh, we see it, and now they talk about it both ways, where uh, it's on the rise, that folks get a, a, uh, an offer, and the company never hears from that person. But for most of us, it's the other shoes on the other foot. You go in for an interview, um, certainly you submit your resume, you never hear. Then maybe you finally get an interview or a second or third or fifth interview and complete radio silence after that. How do you deal with that? What's your advice on it? Well, let me respond to that. <clears throat> um, ghosting is nothing new. It's more pronounced or more obvious perhaps now and more commonplace, but it is not new. I'm old enough to remember that whenever you applied for a job, like answering an ad in the newspaper, you would get a postcard or a letter that said, thank you for submitting your resume. You know, we are considering all candidates and we will let you know. And then they would send you a letter, which let you know, did you get the job or are they inviting you in for an interview? And then that started to wane. You know, the letters stopped. The postcards didn't come so much anymore and they would kind of just ignore you. Now, so what we have today is just a online version of the same. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's not, it's nothing new. The question is, how do you deal with it? And the way you deal with it, in my opinion, is to not get so invested or emotion, emotionally attached to one job possibility. If you are only interested and only applied for one position and you're sitting by the phone or waiting on your computer for a response, you're going to get very depressed and very anxious and it's not going to be much fun. So instead, the antidote to this, in my opinion, <clears throat> is to have many balls in the air, many positions that you're vying for at the same time. To have a lot of uh, opportunities that you are pursuing concurrently. That way, if one of them goes to you, if one of them doesn't work out, if you get rejected, instead of being devastated, you'll say, oh, well, I got five other opportunities, so this one doesn't bother me so much. So you can't control other people's behavior, as I said earlier. You can control your own. And so what I suggest is to not get emotionally attached, not get overly invested in any one role, but to Charlie's point, to be very persistent and keep going after it until they tell you to leave them alone or to drop dead. That's when you stop, but not until then. Did they ever write drop dead in those letters you referred to? <laughs> yes, in large capital letters with exclamation <laughs> points. Okay. 
You know, it's interesting because I'm working with a client now and um, he was all excited last week. He thought he was going to get an offer. I spoke to him this week and he's frustrated. He hasn't heard a thing. And um, one of the things is he never got the contact information. It might seem like a simple thing, but from the hiring managers that he interviewed with, um, most of it is going through the recruiter. So you got to be a little careful. You don't want to uh, necessarily burn the bridge with the recruiter, but there's going to come a point where you can't wait on the recruiter or count on the recruiter where you, you want to say, I'm going directly to this person. I have a relationship with them. I've sp spoken to them. And again, you got to be a little careful about that. But my feeling is this. I'm a hiring manager. I want someone that wants it. I want someone that's going to figure out how to get it done. I want someone who's going to take initiative. And if you do it in the right way and in a professional way, that should be helpful. So get your contact information. Right. And then personally, I advise people you send a thank you note after the interview a week later you might send a letter saying what's going on a week after that what's going on and then the third letter could be a listen i'm still interested i'm still here i'm going to back off a little bit but let me know when you're ready to talk again right and let me add one more thing quickly it's easy to get so frustrated angry that you have an emotional outburst you know don't do that don't get angry and self-righteous <laughs> Don't send angry letters or call up in a tirade. You've got to control that. I mean, it happens. I've seen it. Don't do that. That's a no-win situation. So it goes back to what we've been saying throughout this conversation this afternoon. Is it that's a selling technique, the art of closing. How do you close the deal? And if you have if you say during the, at the end of the interview, they'll say, do you have any more questions and simply say, listen, if I have questions, how would I get in contact with you? Is it OK if I reach out to you? What is your cell phone number or your email address? I'd like to reach out to you if I have any further questions. If, if they say, no, we don't do that. You learn something about the culture. You learn something about maybe how they feel about you at that particular point. But you have to ask challenging questions at the end to get let to know where you stand. You don't want to put your head on the pillow at night with all these kind of unanswered questions that you could answer during the course of the meeting. You know, what factor or factors would prevent them from moving you forward in the process? You right. deserve a right to that answer. But people are afraid to ask that question because they're afraid they're here. No, you're going to get a no anyway. Well, ask, you, know, ask, you want to know where you stand. Why? Because you know you can help them. It's how you ask the question. It's how the context in which you place it. But you need to understand where you stand because that person may never talk to you again. That person may go into a meeting and have an opinion about you based on misinformation, disinformation, or a lack of information that could impact your career's future. So you want to get it clarified before you leave. That's what they do when they're selling $100 million computer systems. Your career is worth a lot of money over the lifetime of your professional life. Therefore, you need answers to those questions. You have a right to them. Also, look, as Charlie indicated, you'll learn something about the company in the way that they treat you. Absolutely. So if this is the way they treat you when you're dating, how, how do you think they're going to treat you once you're married? You know, when you're dating, you're supposed to be on best behavior. If this is how they treat you at the upfront stage, when they're supposed to be putting their best foot forward and you know acting impeccably if this is how they treat you when they're courting you well what do you think is going to happen if you have the misfortune of getting hired there so pay attention to the way that these people are treating you <clears throat> is it respectful is it dignified do they have integrity do they have follow up skills do they i mean you're going to learn a lot about a company just by the way they treat you through this process don't keep pursuing them and pursuing them if they're only frustrating you and, and mistreating you. In a way, Ford, I think what you're saying is don't allow yourself to be a victim. That's correct. You need to stay in the empowered role. Yeah, you know, this, this, this particular point of the conversation also reminds me of uh, the fact that I often get asked uh, by clients and people I'm working with, uh, can I do this? Can I say this in an interview or can I do that? And my advice is you can say anything you want to say. There are no rules in interviewing. The, the main thing is obviously your ultimate goal is landing a job, but to do that, you need to stand out from the crowd. So if you're doing what everybody else is doing, then you're not doing that. 
So asking good questions, challenging the interviewer in professional way, and as Charlie and Ford have both said, doing it the proper way, but you should, you should do things that are different than other people in order to make sure that you stand out as the best candidate that they're talking to. And to that point, um, these days, most interviews uh, are carried out via, you know, the Internet or, or Zoom or whatever. Is there a different et etiquette? Uh, I used to wear a tie. I used to get dressed up to go on an interview. Um, what What's the protocol here for uh, video interviews? Mm -hmm. well, the protocol is if you're if you're dressed from the top up and you're wearing boxer shorts, don't stand up. That's my first advice for you. But, uh, you know, I think it's interesting because I think, first of all, whether in person or uh, uh, virtual, um, I, you need to dress appropriate for the job you're interviewing for. Right. Um, and I always suggest that find out if you can what the culture is, how they dress, and maybe you dress one notch above that. Um, I don't think many people or industries are wearing suits and ties these days. So that would be something um, I probably would stay away from, especially if you're mid to late career. I mentioned earlier about how your LinkedIn profile can be sending uh, messages that you're not even aware it's sending. Well, the way you present yourself can too. So if you're a mid to late career person and you're wearing a suit and tie interviewing with a startup company or an IT company, that might show that you're out of date. That might send a message that you are old. So I think you first need to dress appropriate for the role and the culture of the company you're talking to. And I do think you should treat it as if it was an in-person interview dressed the same way. And one of the things that everybody in the audience can do is, let's say they get approached by a company, um, whether they were found on LinkedIn or, or whatever reason, it's okay to ask that person at the other end of the phone, listen, when I meet with Mr. or Ms. Big, you know, what's, how would you suggest I dress? It's okay to ask that question to a recruiter, because remember, they're presenting candidates that they hope get hired. That makes them look good, right? So if you're saying to them, how should I show up? What's the appropriate way of, uh, of presenting myself? That could, that that's I think is a, is one of the ways you, you can figure out as well. And the same thing with when you're networking with people and they say, "Listen, I'm going to introduce you to my friend Molly over at XYZ Company, and she'll probably want to do a Zoom call." What are they like? What's the culture like? Find that out so that you are comfortable in how you present yourself. And if I could add, please, um, I completely agree with what Ken said about dressing always one step better or more formal than uh, the culture or, or the interviewer. Um, you know, they're not the ones being uh, interviewed, you are. They're not the candidate, you are. On a technical side, we had a webinar a couple months ago where our guest expert gave a ton of excellent tips on how to look good, how to come across well online. And I can't tell you how horrifying it is when I've had uh, some people, some clients show me that, you know, what they look like online uh, when we're connecting for the first time by LinkedIn. Here's how they look like this. <laughs> or like this. <laughs> now, that's not going to come across real well when you're in an interview. So my point is, you have to have good lighting, you have to have good spacing, you have to have the right level, you have to have the right audio situation. I mean, you've got to spend a half an hour at least trying to get this straight, work it out, make it look good, do a practice session with someone to give you candid feedback. So do spend some time on getting your visuals and the audio very professional, very appealing and very appropriate. Excellent. I don't know. Zoom was bouncing around there for a second. So we are kind of wrapping things up. Um, if there's anyone, raise a hand if you have a question. Uh, certainly we've been trying to get, uh, and I think we did get to most, if not all of the questions, but if somebody has uh, something that they'd like to ask, please leap in. And then um, otherwise, uh, as is the usual way here with Beacon, one of the things that um, I learned from Charlie was that in any kind of a meeting, when you come to the end of the meeting, it is very polite and the Beacon way that you ask the speakers, how can we help you? You've been very uh, generous with your time and your information. How can we help you? Ford? 
Um, I work very well with three kinds of people, people who are out of job. Number, number two, people who are in their seat. They don't like it. They don't know how to get out. They don't know how to make a move. And I also work with people that are consultants that haven't, that, that, that their practice isn't working out and they don't know why. I help them try to dis discern what the issue is. It's not their SEO. It's not their website. There's something else preventing people from believing in them enough to write them a check. I help those three types of people. So you may know people that fit those categories. I'm very happy to have a meeting with them. It's complimentary if they know you. I'm trying to help them figure out what can they do themselves to make a dent in the universe for themselves to move them forward. Excellent. So I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I indicated earlier that we are now facing profound challenges in the world. All of us are carrying around varying levels of stress and um, disorientation, confusion, and pain. So just be aware that the person next to you could be in a very bad state of mind. A little bit of kindness goes a long way. Mutual support. I talked about helping others, job search support, job search buddies, mutually supportive clubs and groups. So I think it's a time to be um, excessively kind and concerned with the people around you and go out of your way to be of help and to be as supportive and generous as you possibly can. I think that's a great um, that's a great point, especially going back to one of the earlier questions about how do you keep your head up, how do you keep positive. I have found that you know giving it actually is kind of a selfish thing to do, at least from my perspective, because when you give, you always feel better than the person you're giving to. It gives you a positive energy and gives you a great feeling. Um, in terms of how it could help Mars for you in particular, if you can send me a check or a money order, I'd appreciate that. That would do it for me. And for everybody else, um, really, I would say I do uh, both career coaching and executive coaching. And I think it's the people uh, maybe on the executive coaching side who are currently in roles, who aren't sure what to do, who aren't advancing as much as they'd like to. Those might be the type of people, if you know of them, I'd be happy to speak to them. I, too, offer, as I know, um, Charlie does, and I believe Ford does, too, a complimentary coaching session. So happy to help in any way that I can. And I do want to also, before I finish here, too, say, Morris, excellent job moderating. You really did a, a, a really fine job. Thank you. Great job, thank Morris. Appreciate and Morris, that. Thank you for volunteering today to help us, Morris. No problem. It, 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 it's always a pleasure. Uh, Ken, can you show the slide again with your contact info? And yes, we will be sending out um, when you get the notification. Uh, folks had asked, uh, how do we get in touch with you? So certainly... There's the LinkedIn addresses. Uh, I'll make sure that the um, email addresses are forthcoming. Um, when the uh, session is recorded, you'll get a note, but maybe we can even just send, I know we can send something out to all the folks who signed up with uh, email addresses. Um, excellent. Well, certainly this has been very informative. I know as usual, when I talk to the re these three folks, I learned something new and I've got uh, five new items that I need to look into. Um, didn't even know I was in transition, but we're all in transition at all times. So right. uh, a lot of good ideas. Thank you so much. Any last words for Charlie, Ken? Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.